All right, so example eight, we're given another graph, kind of like example seven. But if you recall, example seven, the graph we were given was the position graph. And now on example eight, it says the graph is the velocity graph. So we're going to be looking at different aspects of this graph to answer the same questions we did on example seven. So um, here's what you might want to do when you're given a graph. Just kind of calibrate your mind for the problem. The y values are the velocities, right? Duh. So whenever the y values are positive, it's moving in the positive direction, which is either right or up. And when the y values are negative, it's moving in the negative direction, which would be left or down. What do the slopes of this graph represent? Accelerations. Okay. And then later on, once we learn how to anti-differentiate, the areas under the, the graph bounded by the x-axis are going to end up being the positions. But we haven't done that yet. Okay, so part uh, A, or let's read. Actually, we haven't even read the question. The graph above shows the velocity of a particle in feet per second, so we do have units, moving along a horizontal line from t equals 0 to 6 seconds. All right, so if we're moving horizontally, positive velocity is moving to the right, negative velocity is moving to the left. On what open intervals, or at what times, on the open interval from 0 to 6, is the particle at rest? Justify. So as I mentioned on Thursday, if we justify in front of answering it, it kind of helps us answer it. So a particle's at rest when the who is the what. What are we looking for for particles at rest? Do we look to see where it's laying on a bed? Yeah, the velocity is zero. Hey, welcome. Yeah, Mr. Herrera called me, told me, so you're not absent. All right, so it looks like uh, the velocity is equal to zero at one, and then again at 4.326. Is that what y'all get? 4.214. Oh, man, we better not guess. How can we figure out what it is if it doesn't cross at a nice juncture point? Find the slope? Yeah. You could actually write the equation of that line segment, right, and find its x-intercept. So before we answer the question, let's do a little bit of algebra 1 work. We have two points right here, which is enough for the equation of a line. It's the point 3, negative 6, and then up here it's the point 5, comma, 4. So let's find the slope first. So the slope of that line segment is going to be the change in the y, which is 4 minus negative 6, all over the change in the corresponding x, 5 minus 3. That gives you 10 seconds, or 5. And so the equation in Taylor form, I'll use the 5, 4, but you could just as easily use 3, negative 6. So the equation in Taylor form is y equals the y value of 4 plus the slope of 5 times x minus 5. And if you would use the other point, 3, negative 6, once you expand it out and collect like terms, you'll get the exact same equation. And so now we want the x-intercept of that graph, so what are we going to do? Plug in a 0 for x or y? For y, yeah. So if you set that whole thing equal to 0, uh, you'll subtract 4. If you want to distribute the 5, feel free. I'm just going to divide through by the 5, and you get negative 4 fifths. And now if you add 5 to both sides, you get 5 minus 4 fifths, which it's time to embrace the fractions. You get 25 minus 4 is 21 fifths, which is the same as 4.2, whatever you prefer. I'll just use 21 fifths. Okay, so we don't, when it doesn't cross at a nice point, you actually have to figure it out. But now that I have that, I'll just, uh, I'll call it 21 fifths. That's it. Those are the only two places where this graph of velocity is equal to zero, one and 21 fifths. So we'll say at t equals one second and t equals 21 fifths second. And then since I haven't written down the justification yet, I'll say since v of t equals zero at these times. That's one way to do it. Or you could say since V of 1 equals 0 and V of 21 fifths equals 0. That's another way to do it. Okay? So again, if you would have justified ahead of it, you would have said V of T equals 0 at T equals 1 seconds and T equals 21 fifths seconds. Just make sure you put units on your final answer. All right, questions on A. Part B. I want open intervals from 0 to 6 of the particle moving to the right. Justify. Well, let's go ahead and justify this time first. V of t is going to be what if it's moving to the right? Positive, greater than 0. So if V of t is greater than 0, 
on what intervals? Greater than zero. So that, that's above the t-axis, right? And uh, we're on the open interval. So that would be from zero to one and 21 fifths to six. So I'm going to put T epsilon, 0 to 1, union, 21 5 fifths to 6 seconds. So that's how you can answer it with interval notation. And then you string together your two intervals with the union symbol. That's where the graph is above the T axis. <clears throat> now, why, didn't I, why did I not put a bracket around T equals 0 because it's positive 4 there or a bracket around T equals 6? positive there. It said, yeah, it said right here, strictly on the open interval. So that, that excluded the endpoints from contention. On what open intervals or at what time is the particle moving at its greatest speed? Who? How do you get the speed off of a velocity graph? Absolute value. Good. The speed is the absolute value of this graph. So you can either sketch the graph Remember, the way that you do that transformation is you leave all positive y values alone, and then you reflect the rest of it across the x-axis. You could do that. Or you could just look for the y value that is farthest away from the x-axis, right, in either direction. So let's see. We got a y value that's four units away there. Here's one that's four units away. Here's one that's six units away. And then over here, the farthest away it gets is four. So what value of t is at the furthest away? At 3. Okay, the velocity was negative 6, but the speed there is 6. So um, you could just say at t equals 3 seconds. And did it ask for what it actually is? No. But we'll just say at t equals 3 seconds, the speed was equal to six feet per second. Now, if it didn't ask you, I wouldn't go ahead and volunteer that. And since I'm doing more than one thing here, I'm actually going to label it speed the greatest. And notice it didn't ask you to justify here. Speed the greatest at t equals three. And now the follow-up question on the same section is when is the velocity greatest? Is that the same question? No. So the velocity now is the actual y values. So negative six is actually where the velocity is at a minimum, right? Because that's the lowest y value of the graph. We want the maximum velocity, so it's going to be, and again, it's on the open interval from zero to six. So it's going to be on the interval from five to six. We don't include zero because it was the open interval. So on the open interval from five to six. So velocity is greatest at T epsilon parentheses, five to six seconds. I think interval notation is a lot easier to use than inequality notation. But you could also have done it like this. You could have said 5 less than t less than 6 seconds. So wh whichever you prefer, they both work. All right, any questions so far? All right, on what open intervals is the speed increasing and decreasing? Justify. So let's go ahead and set it up this time. Speed increasing on and speed decreasing on. So remember, for speed increasing and decreasing, we're going to have to look at two things, namely what? Velocity and acceleration. So we want to know speed is increasing when velocity and acceleration are working together. So that's when your y values, which are the velocities, and the slope values, which are the accelerations, are the same. So where are the y values and the slopes the same? Let's see, negative y values, negative slope, negative y values, negative slope, positive y values, positive slope. Okay? Are there any others? No. Now there's an easier way to spot it. If you have the graph of velocity, the easier way to identify where the speed is increasing is when the graph from left to right is moving away from the t-axis in either direction. Notice on the interval from 1 to 2 and from 2 to 3, the graph is moving further away from the t-axis in the negative direction. And up here, from uh, 21 fifths to 5, it's moving away from the t-axis in the positive direction. That's a quick way to spot it. Okay? 
So uh, can we go straight from one to three, or do we have to step over two? Can we go right through it? Well, let's see. Uh, we're, we're analyzing what two quantities? Velocity, which are the y values. And the slopes are the accelerations. Right. What's the slope right there at two? It doesn't exist. And so you cannot just go straight from one to three. You have to step over it as two separate intervals. So the speed is increasing on the interval from T epsilon one, and I've already forgot, one to two and two to three. Yeah. One to two, two to three, and then one more. And... Um, 21 fifths to 5. And 21 fifths to 5. And then we'll put seconds on the end there. And then the justification, we could say since. Now, here's one way to do it. You could do it two different ways. You could say since V of T is greater than 0. Actually, ah, you'd have to do this as two separate things. Because you here you have to say since V of T is negative and the slopes of V are negative. Uh, and over here, V of T is positive and the slopes of V are positive. So here's, here's probably the easiest way to say it from the graph. Since the graph of V of T moves away from, that's kind of all you need, away from the T axis on these intervals. So I remember when I was grading AP exams back in the day, there was this paper that actually justified it that way, and it wasn't the way that they instructed us to give credit. They would have expected to be something more like this. Since on the interval from 1 to 2 and 2 to 3, V of T is less than 0 and the slopes of V of T are less than 0, while on the interval from 21 fifths to 5, V of T is greater than 0, as well are the slopes of V of T greater than 0. So I asked the table leader, I said, is that okay? And the table leader said, absolutely, yeah. So you could justify that way. If it's the graph of velocity, when the graph is moving away from the t-axis in either direction, the speed is increasing. So then by the same token, the speed is going to be decreasing whenever your graph is doing what? The opposite, moving towards the t-axis. Okay, whenever your graph is approaching the x or t-axis, from either side, your velocities are approaching zero, which means your speeds are also approaching zero. So that's going to be from zero to one and three to 21 fifths. So on the interval from zero to one, union three to 21 fifths seconds. And then the justification would be since the graph, not just the graph, the graph of what? V of T. If you just said the graph, you wouldn't get credit. Since the graph of V of T moves towards, towards the T axis on these intervals. And that's all you'd have to say. Now, we're pretty much going through every single type of question you could possibly be asked. You would not typically be asked both, where is it increasing, where it's decreasing. You would be asked one or the other. So we're preparing for both of them. It's a lot of justification otherwise. What is the particle's acceleration at t equals 4.8 seconds? Accelerations are the what to this graph? Slope. Slope. So 4.8 is going to be somewhere around right in here. Do we already know the slope of that? Yeah, we found it right here. It was 5. So here's all you'd have to say. Uh, does it say to justify? No, it just says to explain what it means. So you wouldn't have to justify you could just say um, V prime, you could say that V prime of 4.8 equals A of 4.8. I wouldn't just say A of 4.8. Why? Have we defined what the A function is anywhere in this problem? No. So you can't just assume that universally A stands for um, acceleration. It could stand for aardvark or whatever, right? So V prime of 4.8 equals A of 4.8, that's good. That equals 5, and then you have units of feet per second squared. Explain what this number means in terms of the particle's velocity. So rather than just saying at t equals 4.8 seconds, the acceleration is 5 feet per second squared, we have to get the word velocity in there. So 
And remember, acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So you'd start off by saying something like, at t equals 4.8 seconds, comma, the velocity is wetting. Good. The velocity is increasing by, and then you have to use velocity units per time, by 5 feet per second, and then write it out PER second. By 5 feet per second each second, or 5 feet per second a second, or per second, whatever. The velocity is increasing. On what open intervals, or at what times is the acceleration of the particle the greatest? If you want the acceleration to be the greatest, are you just looking where the graph is the steepest, or does sign matter? Sign matters, yeah. There is no real equivalent uh, for acceleration like there is for velocity and speed. Speed is the, uh, the name of the magnitude of, ve of velocity. So we're looking to see where the slope is the most positive, or if they're all negative, where it's the least negative. So anything that's a negative slope up here is no good, okay, because that's negative. And, of course, there's zero. So we have a positive slope right there. And that's the same slope all the way through. It's positive 5. So that's going to be from 3 to 5. Does it say to justify? No. So you could just say T epsilon 3 to 5 seconds. And if you had to justify, you would then say, since the slopes of the graph of V of T are the greatest on this interval. The slopes of the graph of V of T. Not just the slopes are or the graph is. Always got to get the specific name in there. If you're ever speaking ambiguously here, like you just say the graph, the slopes, or it, you get zero points. So always be very specific. The graph of V of T, the slopes of V of T, something like that. All right, G is for genius. What is the particle's displacement during the two seconds? I guess I meant the first two seconds. What is the particle's displacement during the first two seconds? Well, let's see. If these are the velocities, we know that it's moving to the right on the first second. And on the second second, from 1 to 2, it's moving to the left. The displacement is the net change in position. What do you know about the slope of this line? It's the same. So here's what's interesting. It's moving to the right at the exact same rate than it, it's moving to the left over the exact same amount of time, yeah? So what should the displacement be? Zero, yeah. It says to justify, zero feet. Well, you could write the sentence that we just talked about. It's moving at the same rate to the right and then to the left for the same amount of time, therefore those cancel out. But this is more of like a, a, a second semester, or not for y'all, we'll get there before then, but this is an antiderivative question. It turns out that if you compute the area of under the curve of these two regions, the area is a multiplicative process, right? So if we're measuring seconds on the t-axis and feet on the y-axis, then the area, let me write that out, the area is one-half the base times the height. The base is one second times the height is four feet. Oh, I'm sorry, feet per second, sorry. You have velocity. So when you multiply one second times four feet per second, well, first of all, you get two, but what are the units going to be? Your seconds divide out and you get two feet. It turns out that the areas under the curves tell you the distance traveled in that particular direction. So this moved two feet moving to the right, and because the area of that Underneath the x-axis is also 2. Um, because it's underneath the x-axis, we're losing that much di distance. 2 to the right and 2 to the left puts you right back where you started. So eventually what you're going to say is the net accumulation of position was 0. And there'll be a way to write that using what's called integral notation. Here's what you'll say later. You'll say since the integral from 0 to 2 of v of t dt equals zero. That's what you're going to write later. So that's just a little preview of coming attraction. That would be the most concise way to justify it. You could make an argument right now based upon 
the, the slope of the line over the same interval of time. But this is, uh, this is called the definite integral, and you'll learn that that gives you the net accumulation. Okay, um, sometimes we're not given a graph or an equation, but rather a, a table of values. So here's the last one in this section. <clears throat> the values of the coordinates S of a bug finally got rid of this stupid particle. Now we got a bug moving smoothly and continuously. If it's moving smoothly and continuously, we know that it's what? Diffable. Very good. The function is differentiable along various values of some line. It doesn't say if it's moving up or down, so you can kind of make something up if it helps you with the problem. Just moving on some line uh, for four seconds, t equals zero to four. So there's also no units given here. So no line is specified, left or right, up or down, and no unit specified. Okay, um, here we go. Part A, what is the displacement of the bug during the interval from zero to four? Well, we're back to now the position values. So remember, the net change in position is the displacement. So if we want it from zero to four, let's label it DISP for displacement. The position function is S, so we'll show S of four minus S of zero. And then we'll pull those values out of the chart. 0 0.2 minus 0 is 40. Now, if you write it like this, you're going to get full credit. On a free response, you can actually stop right there. But look what else you could do on a free response. You could actually just do this on a free response, and that's enough to indicate your method. The numbers that you're using right here come straight out of the chart, and we can then infer that you're doing final minus initial. So that's called the two-for-one deal, but it doesn't hurt to do it with notation first, and then you get your numeric answer. And there's no unit, so we don't have to worry about it. Now we will go further in case this is a multiple-choice question. What is uh, $40 minus 20 cents? $39 and 80 cents, and it would be negative, right? So negative 39.8. No units. Okay, what is the minimum number of times the bug changes directions from zero to four? The minimum number of times. Okay, how are we going to use our position data to determine if the bug is changing direction, either left to right or right to left? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what, what you meant, right. When it changed, when the Y values go from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing, yeah. And we know because it is continuous that it has to do so through a continuum, okay. So notice that on the first interval, the values are decreasing on average, yes, on average. It could have turned around several times in the first half second. We don't know. Okay? It's not guaranteed. For in the next half second, the Y values were decreasing again. So we're not quite sure. It could have gone back and forth a couple of times. But now, since the next interval is increasing, there was one time where it had to turn around. And it doesn't have to be between 1 and 1.5. It could be anywhere between 0.5 and 1.5. It could have already have been up and then coming back down or down and going back up. But we know it had to turn around at least once. And now from 36 to 48, it's getting bigger again on average. But now it's getting smaller again. So it had to turn around for a second time. And then it's getting smaller again and smaller again and smaller again. So it could have turned around infinitely many times. Who knows? Um, but for sure it had to turn around twice. Okay? Twice. So what is the minimum number? I'll just put uh, two times. Explain your answer. Well, this would be kind of like an IVT thing, kind of. Uh, I would just say since S of T is continuous, is continuous, um, there were two times the average velocity 
when you find the average rate of change, you're finding average velocity um, changed from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. So the key there is to say that the average, go away, yeah, the average rate of change, that's what we were looking at, the average velocity, uh, actually, I, I, I misstated this right here, the average velocity changed from not increasing to decreasing, that would be average acceleration, changed from what? Positive to negative, that's what we should say, or negative to positive. So that's one way to do it, or you could say since the, uh, the S of T function went from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing on average. Or the S of T function went from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing on average. That's the other way to do it. So you got to be, be real careful. I almost fell into the trap. When you talk about the velocity sign, you're talking about the previous function increasing or decreasing. But when you talk about the velocity increasing or decreasing, you're talking about the acceleration. And that's not what we were looking at. There will be, bless you, there will be a theorem later on that will help us to answer that a little bit more succinctly called the MVT. Okay? But for right now, without knowing the MVT, we can kind of think about the IVT for slopes, which is kind of what we did. Find the bug's average velocity from 0 to 0.5. Show the work that leads to your answer. Okay, whenever you see this on a question, show the work that leads to your answer, that means that I and college board is going to be looking for your difference quotient, okay, or your setup. The average velocity. So here we go. The average velocity, label it, is going to be the change in position, S of 0 0.5 minus S of 0, all over 0 0.5 minus 0. You have to show the difference quotient. If you know that 0.5 minus 0 is just 0.5, and you just write 0.5 in the bottom, you won't get full credit. Now you can pull the values out of the table. It's 35 minus 40, 35 minus 40, all over 0 0.5 minus 0, 40. Yeah, thank you. And as I mentioned earlier, if you did this on a free response, that's a two for one. That is a difference quotient, so you're indicating your method, and it's also numeric, so you could actually stop there. If you continue on, though, you get negative 5 over 1 half, which comes out to be state change flip, negative 10. That's the average velocity on that half second interval. All right, now it says to estimate the bug's velocity at each of the following. Use proper notation always and show the work that leads your answer. Okay, so this word right here is a synonym for the word approximate. Estimate or approximate. And when you see either one of those two words show up in a question, the college board is going to be looking at your notation for you to have a squiggle. Okay? So whenever you read estimate, you're on squiggle alert. Whenever you read approximate, you're on squiggle alert. All right? So how are we going to approximate the velocity at a point? Velocity at a point is the instantaneous velocity. The only way we can get instantaneous velocity is if we have the equation of the position, we can take its derivative. Or if we have the graph, we can look at either the y values or the slopes, depending on what the graph is. We cannot find the instantaneous velocity from a position table. You can't, which is why they said to estimate it, right? So instead of finding the slope at a single point, we're going to have to use two points. So that's what we're going to be doing here. Now I will say S prime, I'll start off by saying S prime of 0 0.5 squiggles. The derivative of S at 0 0.5 is approximated by. Now if you come up here to the table of values, you look at 0 0.5. Here it is in the chart. There are three ways to do this one. Because it's equally spaced on either side. The two time values on either side are the same distance from it, half unit away. You could do one of three things. You could use the point of interest and the one to the left. So you could say 35 minus 40 over 0 0.5 minus 0. Or you could use the point of interest and the one to the right of it. 
which would be 30.2 minus 35 all over 1 minus 0.5. Or you could actually do a third method. You could use the points on either side of it because it's equally spaced. That would be 30.2 minus 40 all over 1 minus 0. Okay, so when they're equally spaced and your point of interest is in the table, use that point in the one to the left, use that point in the one to the right, or use the point that are straddling it on either side. There are three different ways to do this calculation that are acceptable to, uh, on the AP exam, as long as they all follow the squiggle. Okay, let me rewrite that or equals this. Don't show all three of them. You stick with one and you go with it. But all of them would work. Okay? Difference quotient, squiggle. S prime of 0.5. If you just put V of 0.5 there, V of 0.5, and you haven't defined what V is anywhere, then you're not going to get credit. Okay? At 2.7, kind of the same idea. Let's go ahead and write S prime of 2.7. Squiggle. Is 2.7 in the chart? Yes. Is the distance on either side the same distance away? No, it's 7 tenths away on that side and only 3 tenths away on that side. So guess what? Now you want to use the point of interest since it's in the chart and the one that's closer to it. All right? So that one's going to be 38.2 minus 45. If you get in the habit of doing... The y value on the right divided by the y value on the left, that number in the top is your displacement over 3 minus 2.7. So there's your difference quotient. That's your 2 for 1. That is numeric, and it shows the difference quotient. So I'm not going to go ahead and evaluate that. One way to do that one, when it's in the chart, but it's not the same distance on either side, use the point of interest in the one that's closest to it, or closer to it, I should say. And then at 3.5, well, let's get the notation kind of out of the way. S prime of 3.5, what? Equals or squiggles? Squiggles, the approximate sign, 3.5. Is 3.5 in the chart? No. 3.5 would normally live right in here. So this is the third case. When the number of interest is not in the table, now you have to use the two points on either side of where it would normally live. So you would have squiggles, and you would have 16 minus 38.2 all over 3.6 minus 3. This is kind of what they've been working or leaning towards in recent years, because this is probably the most intuitive, right? If it's not in the chart, you would choose the points that live on either side of where it normally would live. And if they were units anywhere in here, we would have units of Y over units of X. But this problem doesn't have any units at all. All right, so three ways to approximate a derivative from data. When they're equally spa equally spaced and it's in the chart, three different ways. When it's in the chart but it's not equally spaced, only one way. And when it's not in the chart, uh, then you use the values on either side, one way to do it. Okay, all require the squiggles and the difference quotient. All right, the last part, part E, from the information given, is it possible to determine the time and the position of the bug when it is farthest away from the origin? Farthest away from the origin. So if you want to assume it's moving on a horizontal line, the positions are going to tell you uh, where it is. Now, the biggest y value is 48.2. So we know at, at t equals 2, it's sitting on the number line at 48.2. That's the largest y value in the chart, right? But is that going to be... The uh, maximum distance, we don't know, right? Because immediately after 2, it could have gone from 48.2 up to 57 or whatever and then come back. So the answer is what? No. No. Since um, the, the continuous function... Could, and something to the effect, and there's lots of ways to do this, could be anything at the times 
not listed in the chart. Or table. Or you could say, no, we are only given a, a finite number of position values uh, at those specific values of time. There are infinitely many values of time that are not showing, and any of those could be the maximum. So something to that effect, that no. The problem is, is just because you have a largest Y value in your data does not mean that that's going to be the maximum value over the entire function. Now, if, if this was not a continuous function and we only had data points at this, then that would be the absolute maximum. But because it's a continuous function, anything can live between 2 and 2.7 or 2.7 and 3, so on and so forth. Will you ever be asked a question like that? Yeah, very possibly. Okay, um, that takes care of particle motion part one. The worksheet is, is kind of a... a large worksheet. Y'all worked in class on it on Friday. You might have looked in the folder on Friday. There was nothing in there, but it's in there now. It's in there now. I finished that this morning. I was working on that over the weekend. So um, if you need to look at that tomorrow morning, I'll be here early. Uh, I'll be here at 7 again tomorrow, so y'all can look at that. All right. Any questions on rates of change, particle motion? Did y'all have any questions on the worksheet? <clears throat> 